Pastor Mike, for reading that passage. And good morning to all of you. It's a privilege to be here on this Lord's Day to bring you God's Word. As we continue our sermon series in the uh, Sermon on the Mount called uh, Christian Counterculture. And you'll notice that we are in chapter 6 this week. We will come back to chapter 5 in the coming weeks. Uh, Another thing I'll note about our passage this morning is that I'm only going to be preaching on a portion of those first 18 verses in chapter 6. Verses 7 through 15 kind of break the theme of the rest of that passage, and those verses, 7 through 15, will be dealt with at another time by Pastor Ken uh, when he gets to that point to preach on um, the Lord's Prayer. Just want to say that up front, that I'll be preaching on a portion of uh, that passage, so if you notice that I'm not preaching on 7 through 15, it, you'll know why, and it'll become evident as well as to why we broke up the text the way we did. Well, let's pray uh, before we take a closer look at God's Word and ask Him for His help. Father, our prayer this morning is that you would do in us what you in, intend your Word, uh, the effect that you want it to have in our hearts. Lord, I pray that for those who need encouragement this morning, that they would hear it. For those who need um, a word of warning or caution, that they would hear it. And probably, Lord, most of us are in um, both camps where we need encouragement and your word of warning or caution. And so we pray that your word would have its intended effect on our lives for our good, uh, for the good of those around us, and for your glory. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in an article um, entitled, Stop Photobombing Jesus, uh, Pastor Garrett Kell tells about a time when he was serving in a college ministry where God revealed something that was lurking deep within his heart. Here's what he says about that serving opportunity in that college ministry. He says, not long after my conversion, I found myself on stage. An intriguing testimony and an apparent gifting opened up doors for me to speak in churches and on college campuses. Well, despite the encouraging feedback I got from others, I knew that I needed to learn more about the Bible. So I moved to Texas to study under a well-known and a well-respected pastor. Well, that pastor charged us to find an area of service, and so I jumped into the college ministry of the church, assuming that I could help lead the way. Well, God had other plans. The leader of the college ministry during those years had been around enough young men to know that I needed to learn a lesson. So before the first gathering of the year, he said that he had an important opportunity for me. Well, I assumed that what he wanted me to do was to share my testimony or to preach. And so I showed up on that first gathering ready to preach. But instead of leading me on stage, he led me backstage. He pointed to a rope, and he said that I would be serving those on stage by opening and closing the curtain. Well, with each tug of the rope, my frustration increased My hands burned and my heart criticized the speakers. If I were out there, I said, God would use me powerfully. Now, I never actually heard the audible voice of God, but that night I had this distinct impression that God was saying to me, Garrett, if you can't be just as joyful back here when no one can see you as you would be out there where everyone can see you, then you are seeking your glory, not mine. You ever been in a situation like that? You ever been in a serving opportunity like that? A situation where much to your disappointment, instead of having the opportunity to serve in the spotlight like you'd hoped, well, you'd be serving behind the scenes in the shadows like you feared. A situation where instead of you being the one that gets all the recognition and the praise and and the applause from others, someone else would be getting it. Or a situation where the visibility or the prestige of the serving opportunity directly impacted the joy of the serving opportunity. 
You ever experience an opportunity, a serving opportunity like that? Well, whether or not you can think of a situation quite like that, or whether or not you even consider yourself the kind of person who would want the spotlight in the first place, the fact is that we all have within each one of us a desire to be recognized and affirmed by those around us. Every single one of us in this room, in the CAA, tuning in online, we all have this desire to be recognized and approved by those around us. Now, in some ways, this desire can be an innocent desire. Like when a child brings, brings home good grades from school and can't wait to show mom and dad. That, that's a good desire. That, that, that's, that's innocent. But other times, the desire for approval can be a little bit more problematic, a little bit more self-serving. Like when a college kid who's aspiring to be a pastor broods over pulling a rope rather than preaching a sermon. That's when that desire for approval can be problematic. Well, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18, our passage this morning, Jesus is actually going to address this human desire for approval. And he's going to do it by issuing us a warning as well as a corrective. He's going to tell us how not to seek approval as well as how to seek approval. And he'll do this by providing an overarching principle found in verse 1, followed by three examples that illustrate that principle. The example of giving in verses 2 to 4, the example of prayer in verses 5 and 6, and then the example of fasting in verses 16 through 18. Those three examples which highlight the principle found in verse 1. And so the first thing that Jesus is going to address in this passage this morning is how not to seek approval. Look at verse 1. He says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men. Now, some of your translations might just have the word righteousness there. It's the same thing, acts of righteousness or righteousness. It means the same thing. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. You see, Jesus is concerned with the temptation that lurks in every single one of us with doing our acts of righteousness for the approval of others, doing them for the sake of other people. That's actually what he means by the phrase to be seen by them in verse 1. You see, Jesus isn't primarily concerned with his disciples doing their acts of righteousness before men. He's concerned with their doing their acts of, of righteousness before men in order to be seen by them, in order to be approved by them. You see, Jesus is concerned with why we do what we do, why we do our giving and our praying and our fasting, our serving, our going to church, our posting on social media, whatever we do, he's concerned that we do it, whether or not we do it, for the sake of others, for the sake of being approved by others. And if that's our motive, to be seen by others, to be approved by others, well, Jesus says that we'll have no reward from our Father in heaven. He says what could have been ours will be forfeit if our desire is for man's approval. Those are harsh words, but those are Jesus' words. And that's the principle of verse 1. Jesus is concerned with not only what we do, but why we do it. Why we go to church. He's concerned with why we give, why we pray, why we read our Bibles, why we serve in church. And he's concerned with whether or not we do these things to be seen by others, to be approved by others. And so in the three examples that follow in this passage, the example of giving and praying and fasting, Jesus is going to flesh out this principle by highlighting the negative example of the hypocrites. And the first thing that he says about the hypocrites is that the hypocrites do their acts of righteousness in order to draw attention to themselves. Look at verse 2. He says, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, 
as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I look at verse 5. He says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. Verse 16. He says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. You see, in each example that Jesus gives there in this passage, the hypocrites engage their acts of righteousness in order to draw attention to themselves. Their giving is done loudly, right, with trumpets blaring so that everyone in their vicinity well, can see just how generous they are. They don't want that to go unnoticed. Their praying is always done publicly in the synagogues and on the street corners where people will see just how godly they are. They don't want that to go unnoticed. And their fasting, Jesus says, is done visibly. It's done in an obvious manner, right? So they, they intentionally make their faces look somber and disfigured so that those around them can see just how committed they are, just how holy they are. You see, it's all done for the purpose of drawing attention to themselves. A theologian John Stott, he, he makes an interesting note about Jesus' use of the word hypocrisy or his use of the word hypocrites here in this passage. Here's what John Stott says. He says, the word hypocrites came to be applied to anyone who would treat the world as a stage on which they played a part. They lay aside their true identity and they assume a false one. They're no longer themselves but are in disguise, impersonating somebody else. Now, in a theater, there is no harm or deceit in the actors playing their parts. It is an accepted convention. The audience know that they've come to a drama, and so they're not taken in by it. But the trouble with religious hypocrites is that they deliberately set out to deceive people. They are like actors in that they are pretending so that what we are seeing are not real people, but those who are playing a part, putting on a mask, wearing a disguise. And yet, they are quite unlike actors in the, in the sense that they take some religious practice, which is a real activity, and they turn it into what it was never meant to be, namely, a piece of make-believe, a theatrical display before an audience. And it is all done for applause. Hypocrites, Jesus says. Now the sobering truth about religious hypocrisy is that that temptation resides in each and every one of us. No one is exempt from the, the, the temptation to turn a real religious activity into a display for others. We're all prone to this. And so from time to time, it's worth evaluating why we do what we do. It's worth asking why we do what we do. Why do we go to church? Why do we give to church? Why do we serve in church? Why do we do what we do? So, why do we go to church? Why do we go to church? Is it because we're eager to worship God and to, to serve his people? Probably, much of the time, that is in fact the motive. But is it possible that other times we're we're keen on keeping up appearances. We're keen on others seeing us as holy or committed or mature. Is that why we go to church? Why do we serve in church? Is it because we're eager to use our gifts and our resources for the good of God's people and for those that we, we may come into contact with? Probably, much of the time, that is the motive. But is it also possible from time to time we're eager to gain a reputation for ourselves. We want others to regard us as gifted or as needed or as important. Why do we give to church? We know that giving is an essential part of being a follower of Christ, but why do we give? Is it because in gratitude we want to be good stewards of our resources, our money, and so we give back to God a portion of what he's graciously given us? Or... Sometimes do we find that we're eager for a little public recognition? 
maybe a, a thanks from the pastor or the finance committee based on the size of our gift or maybe the sacrificial nature of our gift. Is, is that why we give? We need to evaluate why we do what we do. Now, a word of caution at this point on Jesus' use of the word hypocrite and his talk about hypocrisy. And that word of caution is this. Jesus is infallible, we're not. Which means that Jesus is able to identify hypocrisy whenever he sees it without fail. You and I, we're we're not infallible, and so we cannot identify hypocrisy whenever we think we may see it. We need caution. We need to exercise caution before we label something or someone as hypocritical. Jesus is infallible, we're not. So when you see that friend post on social media, and it comes across to you as showy or braggy, don't assume that that was the motive. It may very well have been posted for God-honoring reasons. Jesus is infallible, we're not. Or if you see someone serving in church, or they're praying a certain way, or worshiping in a certain manner, that to you just comes across as kind of showy, kind of disingenuous caution. That may not, in fact, be their motive. Jesus is infallible. We are not. Well, Jesus says that hypocrites don't just do their acts of righteousness in order to draw attention to themselves. He says that they do it in order to be approved by others. Notice the reasons why Jesus gives for why the hypocrites give, pray, and fast. Look at verse 2 again. He says that the hypocrites give in order to be honored by men. And in verse 5, in reference to prayer, he says the hypocrites pray in order to be seen by men. In verse 16, in reference to to fasting, Jesus says that the hypocrites show men that they are fasting. They fast to show men they're fasting. You see, in each case, the hypocrites desire honor and applause and praise from men, and they'll even employ their acts of righteousness in order to attain that, in order to attain those desires. And here's the interesting thing. Jesus says that they're successful. They get what they want. They're successful in their pursuit of the praise of man. At the end of verse 2, and at the end of verse 5 and 16, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. He says what they hoped to gain by their public displays of piety, the approval of others, they've achieved it. They've gotten it. Right? They were successful in what they hoped to accomplish. But here's the catch. Jesus says that that's all the reward that they're going to get. That's it. Just the, the fickle praise of sinful man. That's the reward that they'll get, and they can expect nothing else. And so after establishing for us how not to seek approval specifically the way the hypocrites do for the approval of man, Jesus is now going to establish for us how to seek approval, specifically the approval of God. Look at verse 3. He says, in contrast to the way the hypocrites seek approval, he says, but when you, but when you, disciples, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Verse 6, but but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen, and then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Look at verse 17, but when you fast, in contrast to the hypocrites, put oil on your head and wash your face. He's saying, take care of yourself, take a shower, be a human so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret 
will reward you. You see, in contrast to the way the hypocrites do it, Jesus says that his followers are to do their acts of righteousness in such a way that keeps the focus on God and not others. It keeps the focus on God. And so instead of announcing your giving with with trumpets blaring, he says, do it in secret. Not even letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And instead of praying in the synagogues and in the street corners and those places where everyone's going to see you, he says, go into your room and close the door and pray in secret. Instead of fasting with an intentionally somber and disfigured face, he says, put oil on your heads, wash your faces, so that your fasting will be done in secret. You see, in each example that Jesus gives for his disciples, the only person that the disciples are supposed to be concerned about is God. He's the sole reason for why the disciples do what they do. It's for God. They give, they fast, they pray, they go to church, they serve for God and for no one else. It's not about them. It's about God. Now it's important at this point to to note what Jesus means by the phrase, in secret. He says it a number of times, in secret. What does he mean by that phrase, in secret? Well, it's important not to press that phrase too literally or too rigidly, lest we become pharisaical about that. You see, Jesus isn't saying that every time we give or every time we pray or fast or do some religious deed, that we have to do it in private where no one can ever see us. I mean, Jesus and the disciples themselves did many of these things in public. That's not what he's saying when he says, in secret. The phrase, in secret, is meant to be contrasted with the phrase, to be seen by others. So on the one hand, you have, in secret, and on the other hand, you have, to be seen by others. And both phrases have to do with why we do what we do. They have to do with our motives. You see, when something is done to be seen by others, it's done in such a way that the doer remains the focal point of the deed. The doer gets the glory. But if something is done in secret, the way Jesus is talking about it here, it's done in such a way that God is the focal point of the deed, not the doer. It's about God and not us. So if you happen to keep track of your, uh, your, your giving to church, which many of us do in a monthly budget or on a spreadsheet somewhere, you're not actually dishonoring Jesus' words about not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's not what's going on. Or if someone sees you praying in public, maybe at a restaurant before a meal, you're not dishonoring Jesus' words about praying in your room with the door shut. Nor are you disobeying Jesus' words if someone accidentally discovers that you've been, pray- uh, you've been fasting. That's not what's happening here. That's not what he means. The point that Jesus is making is that our acts of righteousness can only be done in one of two ways. They can either be done in such a way that draws attention to ourselves to be seen by others, or they can be done in such a way as to keep the focus on God, to do it in secret. And Jesus says that when his disciples keep the focus on God, well, his disciples receive God's approval. Look at what Jesus says at the end of verse 4. He says, Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Look at the end of verse 6. He says, Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And again at the end of verse 18, And your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. You see, the disciples who do their acts of righteousness for God alone and not for man, they're the ones that receive God's approval, God's reward. But that raises a question for us, doesn't it? What does Jesus mean by his talk of rewards? He says that if we do our acts of righteousness in secret, in a way that keeps the focus on God and not ourselves and not other people, well, then we'll receive God's reward. 
Is Jesus implying a, a, a theology of works righteousness that we can somehow earn our right standing with God or somehow earn our entrance into the kingdom? Is that what he means by rewards? Well, it's important to remember the, the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Back in chapter 5, verse 1, where the Sermon on the Mount begins, Jesus began this sermon by sitting down on a mountainside and teaching his disciples. Now, no doubt, the, the crowds were present, and they were the ones overhearing the message, but the message of the Sermon on the Mount is directed towards Jesus' disciples, not the crowds. You see, the disciples, they're the ones who are considered blessed in the Beatitudes. They're the ones who are considered the salt and light of the world, not the crowds. And they're the ones whose righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And so here in this passage, in chapter 6, the disciples are the ones who receive God's reward. In other words, the reward that Jesus is talking about in this passage is for his disciples, not his non-disciples. It's for those who are already following Jesus and who, through Jesus, have a relationship with the Father. And so this reward, their reward, is akin to the, the, to the reward that a parent might give their child. You see, a parent that rewards their child for, say, uh, good grades or for hard work they're not granting their child access into the family. That's not what it's about. The child is already a part of the family. The parent rewards the child to express their pleasure over the child. So the, the, the reward's not about granting access into the family. It's about expressing pleasure over the child. And that's what's happening here in this passage, this talk of rewards. The father's reward for the disciple, isn't about granting the disciple access into the kingdom. He's already a part of the kingdom. He's already a part of the family. It's about the father expressing his pleasure over his disciple, over his child. So Jesus says, do it in secret, and your father will reward you. You'll receive God's approval. You see, what Jesus is saying by comparing the way of the hypocrites with the way of his disciples is that his disciples are to live for the approval of God and not the approval of man. In all that we do, Jesus wants us to do it with an eye toward God's approval and not man's approval. And this is for good reason, right? The, the approval of God is constant. It's true. It's satisfying, it's fulfilling, it's based on the love of our Heavenly Father. The approval of man, it's momentary, it's fleeting, it's insatiable, and it's based on pretense. So Jesus, through his disciples, is telling us this morning, live for the approval of God, not the approval of man. But what do we do if we find that we, maybe more often than not, desire man's approval over above God's approval? What do we do if we find that we so often do our acts of righteousness and we live life for man's approval and not for God's? What do we do about that? If that's the desire of our hearts, which from time to time is true of all of us, what do we do? How do we remedy that situation? Well, ten times in this passage, verses 1 through 18, Jesus refers to God as Father. Ten times. In 18 verses, he refers to God as Father. And in each case, he says that God is your Father. He's the Father of the disciples. You see, the fundamental difference between the person who lives for the approval of God and the one who lives for the approval of man is that the one knows God as their father, and the other one does not. The one person is secure in their relationship with God as father, and so they don't need that security, that approval from others. But the other person has no such security, and so they have to find it in other people. You see, the real problem for all of us 
who from time to time desire the approval of man, is a fundamental failure to know God as our Father. From time to time, we fail to remember the security and the love and the care of our Heavenly Father, and so we live our lives in pursuit of finding it in other people. So my question for you this morning is this. Do you know God as your Father? What I'm not asking you is, do you know that God is your Father? Like if we were taking a test, I could mark true, God is my Father. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, do you know God as your Father? Do you know Him as the Father who cares for you? who loves you, who protects you, and takes pleasure in you, his child? Do you know him as the Father who sees what you do in secret and will one day reward you? Do you know God as your Father? Because the answer that you give to that question, to whether or not you know God as Father, it will determine the kind of reward you seek in life. The approval of man or... The approval of God. Do you know him as your father? Well, in his classic book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer says this about the fatherhood of God. He says, you sum up the whole of New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, Find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and of having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and his prayers and his whole outlook on life, well, then it means that he does not understand Christianity very well because father is the Christian name for God. Well, father is not only the Christian name for God, Jesus says, Father is the very motivation that enables Jesus' disciples to live for the approval of God, not the approval of man. Let's pray about that. Well, Father, our desire this morning, after hearing what Jesus has to say to us and our temptation to present ourselves one way, outwardly, but to be someone different inwardly, desires to know you as our Father, to know the security and the love that you provide, that you give us, your children. Help us, Father, to live in light of that truth, to remove barriers that would keep us from knowing and experiencing you as our loving Father. Would you do this in us, we pray, for our good, for the good of others, for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.